So pharyngeal pouch is an uncommon condition. It's known as Zenker's diverticulum in most parts of the world. So pharyngeal pouch arises because uh, we develop changes in the way that we swallow. And we really don't understand the mechanisms behind all of this and, and, and why it actually happens. But for whatever reason, a small outpouching occurs at the top part of the throat. Um, and that can gather food and drink and can make it difficult to swallow. It also, the food and drink can come back out at various times. So you can find food regurgitating. When, when you lie down at night, it can cause coughing and spluttering because when you lie down, the pouch is compressed and the food and drink accumulated during the day can come out. If it's very, very bad, then it can be associated with people getting chest infections and losing weight because they can't swallow so well. There's also a kind of gurgling noise, particularly if pressing on the left hand side or after meals. Um, and because the food hangs around for a long time, days or even weeks sometimes in these pouches, you can also get halitosis or bad breath as well. So a range of symptoms commonly affecting older people. Um, although we increasingly see them in people in their 50s and 60s, as opposed to 70s and 80s, as we used to in the old days. But we do not understand why people get pharyngeal pouches or Zenka's in particular. Um, it's often blamed on reflux, that is acid coming up from the stomach and into the gullet, the food pipe, and perhaps causing excessive tightening, reactive protective tightening of the top part of the gullet so the acid doesn't come up into your mouth or throat. That's one theory, but it's not a perfect correlation. We don't really understand why it happens. We don't understand why it happens more in males and we don't understand why it happens far more on the left hand side than the right hand side. What we do know is for whatever reason, people develop a, a spasm or a failure to relax of the sphincter at the top of the esophagus, at the top of the gullet. So when you swallow food down onto it, it's closed. And this builds up pressure within the back of the throat and causes a kind of hernia to occur. So a kind of over time, the pressure that should be forcing food down actually causes it to pop out at the side. So a small outpouching occurs at the side in an area of weakness called Killian's dehiscence. Then gradually over time, this area gets bigger and bigger and so from a small shelf it then develops into a, a kind of um, small pool which then becomes a full pouch so we don't really understand what what causes it but the primary physiology of it is tightness of the muscle at the top of the throat and that's where we have to direct our treatment and attention If we suspect somebody of having a pharyngeal pouch, um, then we would, as an initial screening test, usually perform what's called a barium swallow. Um, and this is where you take liquid material that shows up on x-ray and the radiographer, the x-ray uh, technician, will take images at uh, different stages of the swallowing, showing where the liquid is going. And this generally outlines a pouch extremely well. It's possible to pick it up on other forms of imaging, but that's really the gold standard over time. Pharyngeal pouch or Zenka's diverticulum can be managed in a number of different ways, and we have to tailor the treatment to the individual patient. So if symptoms are very minor um, and there's no evidence of anything else going on, it's possible to live with the symptoms. And some people do choose to do that. They don't wish to undergo any surgery because all forms of surgery have potential complications or even if they're small. And they're happy to live with things and, and just see. And if the symptoms develop, then come back and see us and see if we can uh, develop a treatment that's suitable for them. If people are very elderly or very weak or have lots of other illnesses that would mean that we wouldn't really want to give them a general anaesthetic or or subject them to the trauma of, of um, an operation, then it's possible to use endoscopes through the nose or through the mouth to just stretch up that sphincter that's causing the problem at the top of the throat. And that can be repeated if necessary. Or alternatively, to inject some botulinum toxin or Botox, which we most commonly have heard of in the context of 
wrinkles and facial cosmetics, but it can be injected to relax that muscle as well. Again, that has to be repeated over time. So, so that's a possibility for people who, who don't want to go to surgery. The surgical options have evolved a lot in the last 10 years. So the oldest method is an open operation where you make a cut on the outside of the neck, go down onto the pouch, divide the muscles of the too tight sphincter at the top, and then actually remove the pouch itself, sealing over the edge with either sutures or staples. And this usually means staying in hospital for several days um, with tube feeding through the nose um, and has a risk of leakage of contents, which is minor, but possible. Um, and also uh, potential, usually temporary weakness of the voice as well. Because there's a cut, there's also a risk of, of uh, uh, developing bruising or bleeding or infection in the wound as well. So that's the old method. These days, we very rarely resort to that method. Over the last 10 years, things have evolved in terms of treatment. Um, and the preferred route of treatment for the vast majority of people now is endoscopic. That is um, passing a tube into the throat, which allows us to visualize the pouch and directly divide the muscle that's too tight and open things out. These techniques do not involve removing the pouch and you don't need to. The important thing is that there's no longer spasm there. And although there is still a, a floppy area, food and drink just pass into that area and straight down the gullet as they would do normally. And this is very effective. So the method that most ENT surgeons would use involves rigid instruments. This is done under a general anaesthetic and rigid tubes are passed through the throat. And this is the method that we have the most experience of in the last 30 years now, probably. Uh, the main risks of this procedure are damage to the teeth, bruising to the lips and mouth and tongue, um, and also a anywhere between um, five and 8% risk of what's called perforation. That is a leakage of material at the bottom of the operated area. If that occurs, then you have to stay in hospital for about a week uh, with a fine tube feeding through the nose while everything heals up. It very rarely goes on to anything more serious, but obviously that's annoying when it happens, but it's a small percentage of people. Uh, in my hands, that figure is more like around 3%, in fact. However, some people have anatomy that makes it really quite difficult to access the throat using these rigid telescopes. And so uh, it might be big teeth, limited mouth opening, the position of the neck, arthritis in the neck, um, big bits of bone coming back from, from the spine, a number of different anatomical things that might make it difficult to actually access in that way. Fortunately, we now have a way of getting around that. There are a few highly trained specialist gastroenterologists who can use flexible telescopes, bendy telescopes that can get around all these obstructions and that do not have the risks of damage to the teeth and mouth and so on, and that can easily access practically everybody's pouch um, and with very similar outcomes to those for the rigid endoscopy. As more and more experience builds up for these uh, gastroenterologists, we're finding that they are actually, this is a very effective way of managing most patients, in fact. So, so really, it has to be a choice that's tailored to the individual, presenting all the facts and to allow people to make their own choice themselves. Some people elect not to have a procedure, and that's fair if the symptoms are fairly mild. Um, over time, an, an untreated pouch there will cause increasing difficulty swallowing, which become a problem not only at home, but also socially. It makes it difficult to go out to eat comfortably, for example. If it gets worse than that, then the food and drink can spill over onto the lungs and cause what we call aspiration pneumonia. That is where food and drink go down actually onto the lungs themselves. And it can be associated with weight loss as well. But it would have to get quite severe for that. And that's quite a rare situation these days. Um, so we would generally work with the patient to determine exactly when is the best timing as well as the right sort of treatment um, for, for patients with pharyngeal pouches and Zenkist diverticular. It's not one size fits all.